There are two principles of Buddhist practice generally and of our practice that I would like to discuss a little bit tonight. One is everything changes or impermanence. The other one is everything is connected which is dependent origination. Now, everything changes does not mean it disappears. It's just not there the way you would like it to be. So many, many years ago, 1993, I my 16-year-old daughter uh, died in a car accident. Shortly thereafter, I went on a uh, five-day silent retreat in upstate New York. And against the advice of several people who thought it was not good timing for me to be on retreat because of my grief and what I was going through. Um, when I got there, the organizer of the retreat, this was on a mountaintop, there was probably a hundred people there. Uh, it was part of the Sufi order of the West, which was led by Pir Vilayat Khan at the time. He's no longer with us in the physical form. And he was giving private interviews to a few people. And um, I had a private interview with him and the gist of the conversation was, we talked about our losses, his loss and my loss. He lost the sister in an accident and I lost the daughter in an accident. And we talked about that. And he just very gently said to me, they're, they're still here. They're just not here the way you would like them to be. So throughout my life since then, I have honored that. And I think it's important for us to recognize that aspect of impermanence. It's change. It's not the way we would like it to be. If I'm not mistaken, I believe this is the anniversary of Thich Nhat Hanh's uh, passing this week, so last couple of days. I don't remember the exact date, but um, again, one of the things he said somewhere I read about his death is, I'm really not dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not there the way you would like me to be. You know, he, I think he referred to it as clouds, you know. Then when this happens, that happens. So when we honor and respect those, whether they're our relatives, our families, our history, our teachers, the Buddha, whoever, when you think of those beings, you're putting yourself in touch with the things that they've contributed to where you are today. You would not be here today the way you are without all that has happened before. So everything we do today, everything we do now, affects future generations beyond our ability to understand it. We don't know the effect we have by how we go through the world. So when we say we save all sentient beings, when we say we're on the bodhisattva path, what are we saying? We're saying that we will follow this path of the perfection of wisdom so that what we leave behind 
has some benefit. Because we're not really leaving, you see. For this teaching that is like 2,800 years old, um, from Buddha's original teachings, and they're as relevant now as they were then, and they will continue to be. Why? Because of these principles that Buddha set forth about dependent origination and no self. So yes, everything changes. Nothing remains the same. But that's not a loss, you see. That's just change. We talk about non-attachment and not clinging. These two principles that I just talked about can help us to not cling to things by recognizing how things are. This is the perfection of wisdom. Living with those principles, understanding them is wisdom. And then what you do in the world is a whole lot different than when you're clinging to the idea of a self, not getting what you want, you know, the whole poisons thing, you know, ignorance, greed, and anger. Those don't have any hold on you when you're living from the view of the perfection of wisdom. They come and they go, sure, you'll get angry. Of course you will. You ever stop thinking? So this journey we're on, and I'm getting goosebumps, you know. It's like this connection, the word Sangha, you know, the three jewels. How are how all these things are connected? It's mind. I got a call a few weeks ago from someone who found out that I was a student of my original root teacher in Germantown, Maryland, Gosan Shin. And uh, he wrote me an email because he was also a student of Gosan Shin. And, asked me if I remembered this person and that person and on and on and on and, and what my experience was. And I just said that for me, what I learned the most from him, I got in silence. That sitting with him taught me more than all the sutras and words and things you could expound. Because I learned from him about mind, clear mind. His mind was clear like space. Believe me, when you're sitting with someone whose mind is clear like space, you feel it because you have that too. You know, we're all Buddhas. This connection, you know, this is profound. This isn't, it's also just ordinary. <laughs> That's why it's ordinary Zen. It's every day. It's just the way it is. I, I'm always amused by people who say they're bored. <laughs> It happens, I understand, but you know, the mystery of life to me is, how can you be bored? <laughs> it's constantly unfolding in front of your eyes. Just take a good look around. Stop being so self-centered. 
<laughs> yeah. People are so afraid of dropping their ego. If they only knew, you know, what nirvana was, what awakening is, they would drop it in a second. But they have to work at it. <laughs> yeah. So I keep working at it. So any comments or questions? Anything? Um, you know, your talk reminded me of an experience I had some years ago. I was on a retreat with a monk from a forest monastery, and he was talking about a lot of what you talked about tonight of impermanence and not clinging. And at the end, a woman raised her hand and she said, I'm with you on everything except a parent and their children. She said, parents are meant to be attached to their children. That's how you be a good parent. And he said something like, it's even more important to not be attached to your children and to not have expectations of who they're going to be and what they're going to do. And, you know, he gave this whole thing. And, um, and I remember her saying, well, you're a monk, you're celibate, and you don't have children. So I don't think you can understand. Mm -hmm. And he sort of, you know, he just sort of let it go. Mm -hmm. But it just, it just always stuck in my mind. Um, yeah, I think she was having a misunderstanding, and maybe it wasn't communicated clearly, about just what non-attachment is. You know, we talked about it earlier tonight. It's it's yeah. that sense that non-attachment means, in a sense, that you don't care, that you pull yourself away from. But actually, the opposite is true. You're opening your up to be totally present. I spent years parenting, but not really parenting, not really being there. It wasn't until my daughter died that I realized what a shitty parent I had been. So involved in wanting to be a good parent, so involved in doing my jobs, doing the caretaker thing, being what I was told I should be and by society, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So suffering comes from all of this conceptions and projections of what we think we should be instead of what we really are. So he was right. He may not have presented it in a way that she could understand it, but I think he was right. And that's what I learned when my daughter died. And unfortunately, she had to die for me to learn that. So, so. Thank you for sharing. It's powerful. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it's really tricky. We, you know, we talk about Zen being before thought and beyond uh, conceptions and thinking and words and scripture and ideology and all those things that we create. And that's really an important aspect of, of what this is. Because you can't have a mind that's clear like space when it's filled with your projections. Unless you recognize that they're projections, then your mind is clear like space, even with the projections. Mm -hmm. In fact, you never get away from the projections, actually. So this non-attachment thing is really about not identifying with the idea of self. It's no self. It's non-arising, as Buddha says. But that's, you know, we conceptualize that instead of actually experiencing it. Prajnaparamita, or wisdom, is not a concept. It's not something you have to get like you read in a book. It's who you are. <laughs> and it was like the phrase... Um... Uh, we are the bows from which our children as arrows are set forth. Mm -hmm. It was from a book that we're all reading the name, I can't remember the name, but 
Yeah, I think that if, if when I don't feel attached, then I can see a much bigger picture. Well, the other thing is we take responsibility for this being that may have come into this world with its own ideas about yeah. what its job is to do. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you know, we're the one, you know, it's as though we invented them, you know, they're puppets on our strings. <laughs> yeah. And it's it gets confusing because they look like us. They, you know, they they have our they, there's this genetic thing, but this is all. If this happens, that happens. You see, it's all part of how things work. <laughs> Anybody else have anything they want to share tonight? No. All right, well, thank you all for joining me tonight. Appreciate it. See you all again, I hope. Thank you.